Alrighty, so let's go ahead and get started. So my name's Erin, I'm a reference assistant here at Samuels Public Library. And this is actually part of our adult summer reading program, uh, where we're gonna be highlighting a lot of our resources that, um, online resources that we have here at the library since we are currently closed for the whole um, COVID. So we're gonna be going over genealogy uh, resources, specifically Ancestry. Um, since we're currently closed, one of the things that you're able to do now with Ancestry is be able to access it at home. And before um, we closed um, due to the, the pandemic, um, you could only access that here in the library in the building if you're connected to our Wi-Fi or one of our, on one of our computers. So this has been an opportunity for people um, to access it at home. And how we do that, um, I'm actually gonna share my screen really quickly. Okay. All right, so you should see, this is actually our online catalog. I'm going to click over to our website here. Um, this is just our the front page of our website, samuelslibrary.net. Um, under our resources tab here, you can see we have um, a lot of our resources we have under databases genealogy. If I click on that, oops, here we go. It's going to send us to a list of all the genealogy resources we have here. Um, we have Ancestry, we've got Fold3, and we also have Heritage Quest as well. Um, so I'm gonna try and go over Heritage Quest as well. It's very similar to Ancestry, it's owned by Ancestry. So if you've used Ancestry before, you, it's pretty easy to get into Heritage Quest and get used to it. Let's see. All right, and to access Ancestry from home, um, you're actually gonna go to the our, what we call our catalog, online catalog. Um, there should be a login screen. You can actually access that from the main page as well of our website. Get rid of the banner. Um, there's access your account. If you click on this, it should send you to where it's gonna ask for your library card number and PIN. Um, if you can't remember your PIN number, uh, if if you haven't used it before, and because um, a lot of people, um, when they first signed up with our library card, they may not, they've only used it once. You can always um, call us uh, or email us up and um, we'll try and get it, it your account fixed so you can get back online. Um, once you put that information in, it should show up. I have it here. Oh, yes, I did. Um, it should have your name up in this right hand corner and it should have your account and then there should be a arrow that goes down. Um, I'm not going to put my information in because it actually shows all of your, you know, like your address, your phone number and things like that. Um, but once you hit the drop down, it should say Ancestry and once you click on that, it should send you to our Ancestry Library Edition. Which should look like, there we go. And it should send you to the Ancestry Libraries page. Um, now, this is the library edition, so it's a little bit different. Oh, yes, if you have a question, feel free to type it in. And please let me know if I'm going too fast. <laughs> see. Right, so Ancestry.com, um, the biggest difference between this, so what we have is a library edition of Ancestry, and the only big difference with that is that the library edition doesn't have the personalized features you're going to get with a paid Ancestry account. So that's going to be um, access to member uh, membership um, ancestry trees that people have have made and they make available. Um, you won't have the ability to use a family tree maker like you would with a paid account um, and or you won't get those specialized hints uh, that you normally would get with a paid account. Um, but besides what kind of content you can access, I think you can actually access a little bit more than you, what you would get with the basic paid account, um, which is pretty nice. 
Um, now there's some alternatives, like for instance, if you really would prefer to have um, the, the digital tree maker, uh, there are alternatives. Um, I actually have that up here in one of those other tabs. It's called Roots Magic. Um, it does have a free download. Um, now I don't believe it, they have a version for like a mobile device, like an iPad or an iPhone. Um, however, I do believe that there are some apps available for family trees um, that you can get. This one um, for downloading to like a PC or a Mac, it's very basic software, but it's a good alternative if you still want to be putting this in on the computer instead of you know writing it down by hand. Um, All right, so this is the main page for Ancestry and you can tell upper right hand corner it's going to say Samuels Public Library. If you don't try and access it through um, our catalog when you're getting into your account or if you're clicking on the link, like for instance, if you were in here in the library and you went to our resources page and hit Ancestry, it'll send you to like sign up and with a subscription and they'll try and get you to pay money. So, um, but once you do it and you see Samuels Public Library in the upper right hand corner, you're all in and ready to go. All right, so the first thing, and this is going to start with a very basic how-to with Ancestry. Um, there's the banner up here at the top. Um, you've got your home page. They do have a link for searching, which it should take you to the same search um, uh, search engine as if when you hit begin searching here. Um, they have message boards. This is another thing that you really can't um, contribute unless you have a paid account. Um, but you can still use the message boards in Library Edition. You can um, see what other people are currently posting, which is kind of good if you're stuck or you're trying to figure out um, how to do some certain things. Uh, you'll have by uh, location, you also have by category of what people are, because some people, users will post like, hey, I'm having trouble with um, this so-and-so name, can anybody help me out? Or, hey, this was cool, I found this in a record, um, those type of things. Um, next to that, we have the Learning Center. Um, this is actually pretty awesome. They have different tips and tricks you can use for different types of categories. So they have one for if you're just getting started, um, if you're interested in using their DNA uh, project, they have some information on that. Um, if you're specifically using, trying to look for census records, um, here's a little bit more that's uh, towards intermediate use. Um, for instance, the re religious records or um, a little bit more on military or this very cool black sheep if you have a relative way down the line who happen to have been incarcerated. Um, the how-tos to figuring out that information. Uh, so they have a, a lot of interesting resources to check out. Um, the other thing is if you don't want to use a um, online uh, family tree maker or something like that, they do have charts and forms that you can download and then just print off. Um, I use these all the time. I kind of prefer writing it down first and then going back and putting it into a, a tree maker just to make it look all coherent. Um, but they have the basic ancestry chart where you start with yourself and then go towards each family member to different branches and things like that. Um, they also have, I don't see it here, it might be on a different one, um, where it did a timeline which can really help you in, in some areas when you're stuck kind of seeing the entire life of a a family member out, see where um, you might be able to figure out where, where to focus on. The other thing that's kind of cool is they have a new collections link, which actually just takes you to their card catalog, but it's letting you know some of the new things that they're currently adding to Ancestry or that they've updated. Um, the actual number of documents that relate to genealogy and research and things like that, uh, how much they've actually been able to digitize is pretty, is still pretty small. So they're constantly updating it and getting some more records on there. It has to do with, um, you know, the different areas in their um, heritage society groups or, you know, universities and, and the programs that they're working on and volunteers that they can get to do all this digitization. So it's um, a lot of it's done through volunteer work and things like that, but um, everything's new, new stuff's getting added a lot every day. The, uh, the new thing that's going to be coming out soon since we just did the new 2020 census will have the 1950s census being released, um, which took a lot of volunteer work of indexing that and getting on online. So that'll be a cool thing to see on here pretty soon. All right, going back to the homepage here. 
So real quick, when you're first getting on Ancestry, they have some quick links to a bunch of their different um, collections. So if you're looking for something specific, so like a vital records, so that's your birth, marriage, and death records. If you're looking for military records, um, immigration and travel, you can click on one of these links and it'll take you, for instance, I just hit immigration and travel. It takes you specifically to a um, search engine just for that collection. So when, if you're Using this search, it's strictly just going to be on those types of documents. And then also to the right over here is just a quick look for um, the US Census records by going by date. Um, you could just click on that. So for instance, the um, latest one that we can get, of course, since it um, has to be 70 years out, uh, is the 1940 census. And of course, that takes me right to a search engine for that. So go. But we're going to start with just the basic searching. All right, so this is just a basic ancestry search to get you started. Um, I recommend it's only showing you a couple bits of information that you can put in here. They do have a show more options that I can click on. Um, which can give you anything from birth, marriage, death, you know, siblings, things like that. I recommend against putting in a ton of information because how the searches usually work is it's trying to get as much of a relevant uh, result to you as possible. And if you're putting in a ton of information, it's going to disregard some searches or it's going to put it lower on the results page because it thinks, oh, it doesn't have this information. So it's not, you know, related to uh, the ancestor you're putting in. I had this problem when I first started out, I was trying to look for my um, grandfather and I put in everything I could think of, you know, his first, his middle, his last name, where he lived, marriage, death date, you know, all of his relatives. And I just was having such a hard time finding things. And then finally I took out all that information, just left his first, his last, and his birth year where he lived and all, you know, all this stuff started popping up. Um, the other thing that they have here is actually searching by location, and you can actually do this by an interactive map, which is pretty cool. Um, so if you're looking specifically in an area, you can actually pinpoint it on here, and they do have international records available. So you can see if I go over here, yeah, it's got a bunch of different collections, so that's pretty cool. <clears throat> And then they also have it listed down here at the bottom by, um, by area as well, so you can click there. And that'll, once you click on one of those, so for instance, if I'm looking for relatives in Vermont, I can just click on that. And it's giving you a bunch of different collections and the type of collection that they have for that location. But we are gonna start with just a basic search. Okay, so I'm just going to put in a random person here. Let's go with James Smith. How about that? James Smith, and they're going to be from New York. How about that? Born in 1912. Now you'll notice when um, you're putting information, they have a little box down here that says exact. If you click on that, it is only going to give you an exact match of what you're looking for. So it's going to really limit the amount of results that you're going to get. And it's, uh, again, kind of like putting in a lot of information. Sometimes that's not going to be very effective because it's, again, based off what's in that record. And you're going to see this a lot with like census records or with any really kind of record. Um, there wasn't really standardized spelling back then, depending on how far back you're going. And you're going to see records that really are for your ancestors and they, the spelling just may be off. This is the problem with the census. I get a lot with my own relatives. Um, my mother's um, side of the family, they immigrated from Italy. So in the census record, it changed from the Anglican name they changed to. Then the next census, it was their Italian names. So it can really be different depending on what records you're looking at. Uh, see, so that's why they have options you can do to sounds like. So it's going to give you a little bit of variation or similar or even just the initials. And again, with the same thing with the birth year, you can do exact or this is kind of awesome. I like this where you can give a variation of like, okay, well, anything within the net that, you know, two, two minus two years or five years, 
Um, I recommend doing five years only just because, again, as far the further you go back, um, you can see deviations in that. And just because it's not exact doesn't mean it's the, it isn't the person. Um, I think most census records you're going to see, like, uh, they'll put the date of the year down. It'll say, like, about um, 1863 or something about that. Um, so it could really be a deviation of several years. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and do search. And this is what the results page for Ancestry is going to look at. And I just put in a random person. Um, but just as an example, uh, first thing you have a search filter. So if you are going through these results and you're not seeing really what you're, you're looking for, you can change the sliders here to, it's, it's kind of like what it was before with the check mark. Exact, exact similar sounds like uh, could be, you know, an initials um, or very, very broad. Um, usually the default for location is going to be broad. Um, I kind of recommend doing that or like at least, well, country's good. Same thing with adjacent states. Um, I usually do either state or county and adjacent counties, especially if you're looking at an ancestor in a county that the county lines were changing a lot. Um, we're here in Warren County, Virginia, and our county wasn't even a county until like mid 1800s or so. So if you're going back you know, even further than that. We were, at one time we were Frederick, at one time we were Shenandoah, we were Albany. So it's one thing to keep in mind when you're looking at ancestor, ancestors going back, you know, into the 1800s and other states where um, it may not have been called that at that time, especially if you're looking for a record that that's, the location date's gonna, gonna be different. Okay. Another thing you can do, you can filter the results by category. So again, if you're looking for something more specific, so you've put their name in, but um, you want a census or a voter, like pretty much a census, you can click that. Go ahead and do that. All right, so that went ahead and gave me, these are just, just census records. And it's also, allow you to filter further by year as well. Oh, also by location, I didn't realize that. Um, so they also have uh, European census, I didn't realize that. Um, so that was a newer thing. Let's see. Okay, so I'm going back to the first results page. And even says here, new filter that they have. Um, you can go further by location, which that's pretty nice. Um, so at least you can get the, the general area right. And if you're kind of have a date range that you're looking for as well. Uh, one thing that you're going to see up here, um, this is again, it has to do, it, it may be a little annoying when, since you're on the library edition. Um, it'll give you information if somebody has made a public family tree and they have that person currently listed. So you'll be able to see this, but you won't actually be able to access it. At least I don't believe so, unless they changed that on me. Oh, they changed it on me. Okay, so yes, you can actually um, access the public family trees now, which is pretty awesome. So um, that can come in handy. It, it's somebody who's, are, uh, somebody who's also a member. Um, they have a, a paid membership for family tree and they've added it to um, some of the things they've already done. So you can see what research that they've done and made public. Um, one thing I will say about the public family trees, um, unless you know the person, you may not be sure how well they've done their research on it. So it could be right, it could be wrong. Uh, it's a good way to get new I, you know, ideas on, on, especially if you're stuck. Um, but it is kind of, my rule of thumb is to um, also double check to make sure um, everything looks correct. Okay, so getting to the actual results. So let's say, let's start with somebody. I'm gonna do, this is a James J. Smith Jr. Okay, let's say this is the person I'm looking for. They were born in 1913. And first thing it's giving me is a, US, a World War II draft card. So the cool thing about this is for, to make it more efficient when you're searching, if you hover over the actual um, 
record, it's going to give you an index of everything that they've made that's, that's actually part of that record. Uh, so it'll give you the name, any, any information that's, that's on it. Um, so it gives you a quick look. So for instance, I'm looking at this, uh, if I knew, let's see, it looks like he was married. So um, I knew, you know, his wife's name and then I'm like, okay, yes, I know that's the correct person I'm looking for. Then you can go ahead and click on that. And it's going to take you to the index page for that document. And one thing I will say, it is all, most of the time the information is correct, but every once in a while, um, depending on who indexed the, um, the document, I always say double check uh, and view the actual self because again, it's handwriting. Somebody may have thought, you know, a O was a C or something like that. And so the index itself may have some incorrect information, but the document itself is actually correct. And you can view that. Doing this here. So this is actually a really cool draft card. And the resolution on these are actually pretty awesome. Um, in order to move around, um, you can actually just click on the document itself and just move to see different areas. If you think it's kind of zoomed in too much, on the right hand side, they actually have a bar you can use to change that, or you can use the plus or minus size as, as well. Okay, and then it'll tell you the information of what it is you're looking at in the person. Um, now you can do a save here. Um, now while you can't save to a family tree, one of the things you can do, um, it gives you the option to either, it says send the image home or save to this computer. Um, this is what we would do here at the library or I would do, you could save to this computer and then you know either save it to an online, um, like if you had a Google Drive, for instance, you could save it to that, or you could also email it to yourself, um, or even print it out here at the library as well, or you can do that at home. So it does allow you to save the image of the actual document you're looking at. I'm gonna go ahead and go back to the index here. Another cool thing that's really awesome with this is if you discover somebody new, so for instance, um, I was looking for this individual, but I did not know that this was his wife. Um, I'm going to go ahead and click on this. And it actually takes you to the document uh, index from their perspective. So this is from the perspective of the wife. This is a little bit more interesting if you're looking at like Prince is a census record. Let me see if I can grab one of those. Okay, this is somebody completely different, but I'm gonna use this as an example here. All right, so the index, um, it's gonna give you, again, tries to give you as much of what's on that actual document as possible. Um, and I can actually show you the census here. So this is a 1920 census, and what's really great is it's actually highlighting the individuals you're currently trying to look for. So this is highlighting the, pers the individual person you're looking for, and then it's showing you everybody else in that household as well, which is pretty nice. Also, uh, and this is for the census that they do, um, it allows you to see the different categories of the information that's currently on the census, which is great because some of the other sites that, um, and there are other genealogy sites who do have the same collections, um, they don't allow you to see the actual collection or the, the, um, the column names as well as some of the other ones. So that's a cool feature that they have. It does have a couple of other things here as well. Um, it, it allows you to, to uh, manipulate the, the image. So um, if you want to do a direct download, if you want to print, um, if you want to invert the colors, I've never done that before. Um, you can do that if it's a little bit easier for you to see the handwriting and figure that out. Or if, I don't know, for instance, if you needed to flip it. <laughs> um, so it allows you to do that as well. Let's see, it looks like they have a couple of more settings. Oh, yes, so the way it's highlighting things, you can actually turn those off if you prefer. Um, so there you can turn the highlights off. I prefer those on, though, personally. All 
Robert, I'm going to go back to that index page. All right, so cool thing about the census index that they do, um, it's listing every member in the household here and the ages. So if, especially if you're trying to figure out um, a particular um, family group, uh, this is a great way, I always say censuses are a great, great way to start doing your research because it's giving you more names to, to research and it's telling you their age. Um, like for instance, I didn't know this person, I can go ahead and click on them and it's going to switch to giving the information about them in the census instead of the other person as well. Um, another really cool thing, especially for census, it also allows you to view others on the page, which is great. Um, this is especially helpful. Um, uh, some people may not realize that a lot of, especially in the rural areas, a lot of family members may live close enough to each other that they're going to not necessarily neighbors or they may live close enough that if you go a couple of pages down from the census, um, you may actually see another family member on there as well. I actually found out that my great grandmother, um, her brother actually lived next door and I found that out by looking at the census and checking on the neighbors and seeing, oh wait, they have the same last name. <laughs> Yep, or they married the new girl next door, yes. <laughs> oh, that definitely happens as well. <laughs> All right, let's see here. Let's see if there's some different ones. Um, let me try doing. A lot of what I do on here, I'm looking at the census. Um, you can find so much good information on those. Let's see. Let's try doing, well, let's say all of this is being is, is census and let's say I'm just trying to find something else besides that. Um, oh, that's because I actually filtered it by that, of course. Let's go back here. All right, that gives me the first search that we did, I think. Yep. No, wasn't the first search. All right, there we go. Okay, so we're back to the first search that we did here. And a lot of this first is World War II enlistment records, which is pretty cool. Uh, let's see, let's try and do, let's say I was trying to look at uh, birth, marriage, and death records. If I click on that, it should limit it to those different collections. And when it does that, um, it actually limits it further. Um, it's usually they start with like the more higher categories and then just kind of deep, go more specific from there. So I got just birth, just marriage, and just death records. Um, now this is one thing you'll see up here. Um, like for instance, this is a find a grave index. This is actually an index from another site um, that is, I, I don't do I can't remember if Ancestry bought them too or not. Um, but this is another site you can actually go to, um, so it will actually link to other resources that you can use. That's a free site. They're really awesome. Um, I'll go ahead and click that here. So this is Find a Grave. Um, they, I guess Ancestry did buy them, or either they are now sponsored by Ancestry. Um, this, uh, this website, I love it. They a lot of it's volunteer work and you have individuals going to cemeteries and just documenting all the different headstones and making available online. Um, that being said, you can see some errors in this site, um, which then again can then transfer over into Ancestry since they are drawing that information from Find a Grave. And um, that usually is because uh, a lot of the volunteers who are doing this, they don't actually know the people that they're documenting. So they're usually going off of connections um, based off proximity to like the tombstones and things like that. Uh, I had this happen with, I think my grandfather got, I think he actually got listed in the wrong cemetery, um, but it had his aunt listed as a sibling because they were close enough in age. Um, and that was, they just mostly thought that there was another sister just because there was close enough. Um, but in fact, it was an aunt. 
So it's just one thing to keep in mind when you are um, seeing that on Ancestry and then if you come over on to Find a Grave. All right, and again, it usually is going to give you the, the index first, and again, they're drawing that from the other site. Yep. Find a Grave is usually a good go-to. All right, I'm trying to find one. Not everything on Ancestry. Oh, this one does too. That's pretty good. Um, sometimes when you're on Ancestry, they won't actually have the photo of the document itself. Sometimes that has to do with um, them not having the um, the access or the ability to put that on there, um, and they'll just have access to the index itself. Uh, that that would be all this information. So it's information that's in the document, but they can't. They just can't show that document itself which um, can be a little annoying for some things because the index may just have basic information and not everything that's going to be in the actual physical document. Um, usually they do have the source citation, so if you did want to um, access that, it should be able to tell you where the physical document is located. Um, for instance, I think this is a birth index, so it would have to be through um, Department of Health especially as it is 1917. Um, for those who aren't aware, if you are trying to find vital records and you can't find everything online, because um, like I said at the beginning, uh, what's actually been digitized is a pretty small number to what's actually out there. So if you are having trouble on Ancestry and you just can't find something, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Um, it could be that it just hasn't been digitized yet, in which case, um, if you know what location you're looking at, so for instance, if it isn't local here in Front Royal or Warren County, um, like for instance, I have to do a lot of research in Vermont, um, I always recommend just call up the local library there, um, and ask a librarian, you never know. Worst case scenario, they say no, but usually they're pretty good at, at knowing their own locations, resources, and they may be able to uh, steer you in that direction. You may have to take a trip, but at least you'll know it's there. We do that a lot here. We have people who will email us for um, obituaries and, you know, the Warren Sentinel or um, they're looking through, they're trying to find some information that we have in our Virginia history room. All right, what else do we have? Okay, this is another thing. Uh, let's see. Is the Sentinel Index? Um, so no, unfortunately. Uh, we have the Warren, we have a microfilm of the Warren Sentinel here, um, which you can come in and, and search through. Uh, we have a micro, uh, sorry, microfilm reader. Uh, so for Warren Sentinel, uh, for when it starts, it goes back to a technically 1900. However, the earliest reel that we have, um, it only has about four or so uh, issues that I believe that they were able to save and then uh, copy. So. If you're able to find anything of uh, value uh, or it's if you, you'd have to have those exact information in those exact issues. Um, but we do have um, probably 19 late 1930s, some 1940s. There's a couple of um, decades that were missing, uh, but we do have at least some uh, that people can look through. Unfortunately, it's not uh, uh, full word search, so you do have to know the exact date that you're trying to look for. Um, I wish eventually we can kind of digitize those and get them uh, online, but that will be a hopefully a project in the future that we can do. Uh, we also do have Northern Virginia Daily as well. Again, it's not indexed, uh, but we do have microfilm readers that people can go through it. Or if um, you know you can't get to the library, you can always let us know. We can see if we can't find an obituary or whatever information you're looking for. Um, Let's see here. Oh, newspapers.com. That's another thing. Um, they'll have the index for uh, as well for that. If I click on that, um, you'll see that's that's where it's got the no image text only collection um, thing on here. That's because again, they don't have access to put that on here. They're doing it specifically though, because newspapers is another sub subscription of them. <laughs> uh, we currently don't have that. Um, I have used it before. I will admit, I do kind of like it. Uh, but they at least give you the index so you know that it exists. Um, this is an obituary index, so it's at least telling you, yes, there is an a obituary for this individual, um, at which case I would recommend, um, there's a couple alternative sites you can go to. Uh, the Library of Congress actually has Chronicling America Project, depending on how far back of a, of a obituary you're looking for, you may be able to find something there. Otherwise, um, again, I always recommend just kind of uh, 
calling or um, uh, tr trying to talk to the people who the um, either Heritage Society or a library in the location of wherever that uh, newspaper is located to see if they have um, the obituary. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so let's try a different type of collection. Okay, we were doing vital records. Oh, looks like I have to go back again. Let's see here. Nope, that's still vital. There we go, okay. So let's say, um, some of these, again, I'm not a professional, so I could still kind of my, consider myself a novice with genealogy. So there's some categories I don't have as much um, experience with, um, with searching, but I'm gonna go ahead and hit immigration here. Um, so it does have some information from like Ellis Island um, and some of the other ports um, that would come in for Immigrating, they've got some of the passenger and crew lists and things like that. Go ahead and click on one of these so it shows. Um, and it, especially for this, because um, like for instance, my, I'm, I'm doing my dad's side of the family. I can only go back to about 1818 because sometimes the passenger lists literally only have their name, their age, and where they disembarked from, um, which doesn't help when there's three guys with the same name, same age, and disembarked on the same year. <laughs> Here we go. All right, I'm gonna make it really zoomed in first. Zoom out, okay. <coughs> so this is another example of when you're looking at another piece of, in, uh, another document. Um, and you can tell sometimes the handwriting can be hard to discern. Okay, oh, this is a flight number. Had not seen one of those before, that's pretty cool. All right, so I'm gonna start getting into some tricks to when you're actually doing the searching. So um, these are the, so I've already kind of shown different uh, types of documents you can see and what they look like when you're um, clicking on them here in Ancestry. Um, they have a couple of tips that if you're just having a lot of trouble trying to find something. Um, let me go back to the main search here. So, yeah, so one of the things you can do is just start adding a couple of smaller things in here. Um, let's see. Oh, I already did that one. Sorry, I'm going off of one of their um, tip sheets that I had. And I kind of, I just realized I went over a bunch of them already. Um, a lot of that was just add, making sure that you broaden um, your results. So again, it's adding the, you know, five years uh, to or, or from the birth year in order to uh, get some more results. Another thing that they'll do um, is you're specifically look, looking by collection. So uh, they've got the special collections thing over here and that's going by the different um, categories. So uh, you know, we were, let's say we're just specifically looking at passenger lists. We can do that. Um, and what's really awesome is they'll give you information on the, the collection itself, um, which is pretty nice. So it'll at least tell you, um, you know, what kind of details that they're giving. Um, let's see this one. Yeah, and it'll tell you some of the uh, cons against using the collection too. So it'll say like, you know, lists were not kept for every ship, um, could have been lost. So, you know, you may not actually be able to find anything, but um, things like that. Um, they also have uh, narrowing, de narrowing down where you're built, that you're looking at. So, you know, USA, Australia, Canada, Europe, and then also by date as well. Um, they've got four from 1600 to 1699, that's pretty cool. And notice I haven't actually put anybody's name in yet. Um, this can actually be pretty beneficial. Um, some of the stuff that I've been able to find for my own family, I've never actually put in a name for. It was mostly just going, looking at collections. 
seeing it, if it may pertain to them and then browsing through and I was able to find things. I've done that with Bold3 before. Um, and if you, if you don't find anything on Ancestry, I always say when in doubt Google, um, I was able to find a collection of Revolutionary War, kind of like pay stubs um, from a university up in Massachusetts that had them, they, they weren't indexed, they were digitized, but they, they just had the photos on there. They had them in alphabetical order though, so you're literally going through the different um, photos until finally you, you know, alphabetically get to the surname of your ancestor. And I was able to find them that way. They were in the Continental Army and that was pretty cool. Um, one of Ancestry's other sites, which we do have, and you should be able to access it at home. Uh, we have it, um, I showed it earlier. If I go back to genealogy here. All right, we also have Fold3 as well, which is mostly going to be military records. They have a lot of collections. We may actually be able to access those on Ancestry as well. Um, but they're, they're not indexed so that you can really accurately search by putting in a name. Um, it's easier to just click on them and go through the photos until you find somebody that's relevant. Other thing, let's see. Oh, uh, they also recommend it's make just kind of going through the new collections as well, because let's say, you know, a couple of years ago, I was looking through one of the collections and I couldn't find anything. Again, they're adding things constantly every day. Um, they may have just not had, they had not gotten to my ancestor at that point when they were, um, you know, digitizing these records and, you know, a couple of years down the line, oh, they, they now have it on there. So sometimes it's good to revisit some areas of your research or um, collections that you were searching uh, on Amazon for uh, periodically just to see. I'm trying to click here, maybe it's a bit old. It may have frozen on me. Let me go back. There we go. Okay. Yeah, and again, this is just their card catalog, and it'll, um, you can sort by up here. So this is date added. Um, you can actually go by title. Here. Does Samuels have any events for local genealogists? Um, so the classes that we've been doing, um, we have an awesome uh, local professor from Lord Fairfax Community College who does a genealogy workshop. Um, unfortunately, we've had to uh, cancel those since we are currently closed here at the library. Um, as far as other events, I, I currently, well, I, I was doing um, kind of a basic, uh, this kind of like what I'm doing now, it's uh, what resources we have here, how to do basic searches, things like that. Um, there's also the local heritage society. Um, I'm not sure if they do other um, genealogy specific, specific events. Um, but they're definitely an organization to check out um, as well. Um, also, they're, again, they're also closed <laughs> because of the whole um, COVID pandemic, but they, there's the Hanley Library up in uh, Winchester. They have an amazing archive that's pretty cool as well, if you haven't checked that out. Uh, let's see. Oh, right. So card catalog, um, you can sort by database title. So that'll make searching through it a little bit more easy if you're looking for something specific. Um, otherwise, you can be do date added, um, or you can also go by record count, which is kind of cool. Um, of course, their public mem member trees are gonna be the most, the highest thing that they have on here. Um, I have used those before, um, which are pretty, um, pretty nice to, to use. I think if you are interested in using their public member tree, but don't want a, um, paid subscription, I think they do have a software you can buy from them um, that has either the same thing or something similar as well. Uh, let's see. Okay, one other thing. Um, I know there was, let's see here. One of the more useful trips, trip, yeah, sorry tricks that I've seen that comes in handy, especially when you're searching for ancestors and there's that problem with their name changing constantly. Um, you can use it, it's a, basically a wild card. So what you're basically gonna tell the search engine to do is kind of ignore a couple of things. They sort of have it built in already. So like if I do, let's see, James Smith again. 
uh, it's kind of similar to what you can do here where you're telling it to sound like sound similar. Um, I'm actually going to change this. Let's see, I'm going to put a asterisk here and it should end up Well, that's doing here. Here we go. See how it is also giving me variations. So it's doing Smith with a Y instead of an I, um, and it'll essentially do the same thing. They had another one that was much. There we go. So there's several ways you can do that. Um, you can also do it by using a question mark, which the question mark, if you do that, it's going to replace a single letter. Um, while if you do, um, so like if I do that one, oh, there was actually with a Y, <laughs> it's pretty cool. Um, replacing with the one I'm gonna do okay so you can see there's a couple of variations as well is there a not search um I don't believe so I wish there was <laughs> um that would actually make things super easy <laughs> um yeah, I don't think, like, they they have it so that you can, um, yeah, they'll, they'll make it so you can do variations of it, but um, they don't have excluding. That's one feature that I love it when they do that in any kind of database. Um, I would love it if we had it in our catalog. Uh, just be like, um, you know, I want this, not that, um, which Boolean logic, that's what we usually call it if you're doing a basic search engine um, where you do, like, um, Let's see if I was doing, if I did James, not Smith, um, it usually would uh, exclude that and only do the James. Ooh, that's James. There we go. Which I don't think that's going to work in, in the certain way it's supposed to. Uh, let's see if I do, okay, this may do what I want it to. Okay, what that's supposed to do, it's considered a wild card. It's supposed to replace potentially tricky letters in a name with a question mark or an asterisk, which the question mark is supposed to replace a single letter while the asterisk replaces zeros or more letters. Uh, for example, uh, what it's supposed to do when I use that particular one that I put in, um, it will match Smith or Smith with a Y or Smith uh, with a TH and an E at the end or Smithers and Smithson is, or other deviations that are close enough to that are also longer um, than what it is. Which this, of course, there's just so many Smiths, it's just giving me Smith. Or if I do, well, I don't know if this will change it. Then we'll Uh, this came uh, in handy for me when I did, um, like, for instance, my last name's Rooney. Um, there was a couple of times where we got changed in the sense, like, it was, I can't remember what document it was, um, but they had us as Looney instead of Rooney. <laughs> um, and it was the same, I mean, the the individuals, it, I think that was a census, I, I, I'm pretty sure, but the family members all were correct and the dates were correct and everything, the location was correct, so I know it was them. <laughs> Um, but they had an L instead of an R. So you're going to have those pop up periodically. All right, so that's the basics of Ancestry. Um, if you guys have any more questions specifically on Ancestry, please go ahead and, um, you know, type it in. Or um, uh, if something, if you're using this later and you have a couple of things pop up, uh, please feel free to email us at reference at samuelslibrary.net or you can send us a um, message over on Facebook or again, feel free to call us. Um, I have the phone number here. It's 540-635-3153 um, and you would just ask for reference and we'll, we're more than likely, uh, we're more than happy to help anybody with genealogy research. Um, 
I am actually going to switch over to Heritage Quest now. And like I said, if you've done, if we, since we've done Ancestry, it's going to be pretty uh, similar since, again, it's owned by Ancestry. Yeah, what, what is the difference between, if we start, I mean, it, isn't it related to Ancestry.com? Uh, Heritage Quest? I, I don't know for sure. Let's see, Mitzi, if you're trying to ask a question, I couldn't actually hear. I'm sorry. There, can you hear me now? Can you hear me? No, okay. Here, I'll pause for a second in case we have a question. Okay, let's see. Is Heritage Quest related to Ancestry.com? Um, yes, so it's, and you can t like tell this is pretty much the same thing as the Ancestry homepage. I'll switch over again so you can see the similarity. Go back to their homepage. So it's actually the, the begin search thing is the exact same thing. Um, I don't believe they started out the same. Ancestry is kind of like the godfather of genealogy sites now. They're kind of um, picking up a bunch of ones now. Um, so for instance, newspaper.com is now owned by Ancestry. Same thing with, um, I think Find a Grave now as well. And then you've got Fold3 um, and they kind of are all under the Ancestry umbrella, uh, which means if you didn't use, or if you're not using the library um, uh, version, you would have to use a paid account with them. And I know like Fold3, Heritage Quest, like uh, newspapers, they're all sub subscriptions to a main um, Ancestry account. And we currently just have Heritage Quest and Ancestry. Heritage Quest, a lot of what's on there, you can actually also access on the Ancestry site, but it's kind of nice if you're specifically looking for these things. Like it's really great when you're looking for census records. Um, they also have some city directories. They do have um, local and family histories. These are usually like the um, family genealogy books that would get published. Um, and we currently have some here at the library. I'm not sure of those specifically, um, if some of those are in here, but um, they're those types of books that got digitized and placed online. Uh, they do have some uh, Revolutionary War documents as well. Um, they have a way for you to search obituaries. They do have the Freedmen Bank as well, um, a lot of their records, which is pretty cool to go through. Uh, let's see. They do have also the agricultural industrial schedules as well from the censuses uh, that you can look through. And they have the Canadian census as well. Um, I think that's newer from when I was on here last. Let's see. Um, and again, they have the first begin search thing. If I do this, um, it's going to ask by collection. Um, that's one thing that's different from Ancestry. Ancestry, when you're usually searching, it's like you can just do a basic overall search of literally every collection. Um, and then you can limit to what you want to look for. Um, with Heritage Quest, you're usually specifically going into those collections. So for instance, let's say I was doing the census, I could go ahead and click on that. Um, and it's going to go, you can do a general search of the census or you can go by year as well. And which is awesome at the bottom here, it's actually telling you which one has been updated, <laughs> which is pretty nice. And then let's see, they also do have some other stuff down here, which is the, um, oh, the Delight one. They've got um, the Native American ones as well. So they have a bunch of other ones. So I, I just prefer going on here when I'm looking at the census, just because it's specific to that. Um, and another fun fact about the census, if you didn't know, um, 1890 census, they have the veteran schedules on here, which is pretty cool. Um, if you're actually able to find anything, like it says fragment specifically, um, it's why we have a national uh, archives now because there is a bad fire back in um, uh, turn of the century that pretty much destroyed the entire census. Um, there, and mostly it wasn't the fire, it was um, everything got wet. Uh, it, they had a, a pipe burst or something um, while the fire happened and uh, while they do have some of them, you can't really read it anymore. Uh, but they do have some stuff, so if you're able to find uh, 1890 census, that's pretty awesome. Um, I'm going to click on, well, let's go ahead and put somebody in here. Let's see James Smith again. 
Let's do here again. It would help if I spelled it correctly. All right, and it pretty much looks exactly like the Ancestry uh, results page. Um, they do the same thing now. You can see it says new um, instantly filter by location and time period. That's the same filter that they had over at Ancestry as well. Uh, I, think, I don't think they have anything really different. Um, I'll just go ahead and hit this 1930s one. Um, it's pretty much the same setup. They have the neighbors view on another page. They have all the citation source information down here. And then the view, I believe, is also the same. Okay, what is the difference between family search and ancestry.com? So family search was actually kind of like the big contender for ans from ancestry. Um, they actually kind of work together a little bit now. Uh, family search is run by the Church of Latter-day Saints. Um, I actually use both. Um, so a lot of the collections are going to be the same. Like for instance, family search also um, does have uh, like the census records and things like that. Uh, the main difference, I will say, I like searching international records on Family Search more than Ancestry, just because their search engines work a little bit different. And you're going to get, for me anyway, from my experience, you get more accurate international sources using their site. Um, it's also free; you don't have to pay anything for Family Search. You do have to create an account with them, and they do have a um, they have a family tree set up that you use. It's a bit different though, but. Um, yeah, their family search is kind of like the other real big uh, genealogy website that you can use. Ooh. All right, so yeah, you can see when you're accessing, it's pretty much the exact same as Ancestry. They highlight a lot of the, um, the particular family members that you're looking for, um, and you can also save during using the same way. I think as far as differences and how you're searching on the, the different Ancestry sites, um, Fold3 has been the most different for me. Um, I'll actually be doing one, I believe, on Fold3, I think it's next month as well. Um, and I think I'll try and do another Ancestry Heritage Quest um, session in uh, January as well for anybody who's interested. Let's see. Oh, awesome. Yay. <laughs> okay, so that's the census. I'm going to try a couple of other ones um, just so you can see how those kind of look. Okay, let's, let's do the results page. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, Let's try will and probate. Okay, so you can see they have, they actually go by states. I think the three big ones that they have now are these may actually just be new that they're highlighting. Uh, you got New York, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, Ohio. Uh, let's see, Alabama. I'm actually gonna, let me try doing one of my own because my family members up in Vermont back in the 1800s actually got in trouble a lot. <laughs> let's see here. Okay, yeah, it's pretty much the same setup. Um, well, again, what I really like about this is they actually talk about the different collections, and I actually recommend reading through these. And also, on um, it doesn't show it on this one, but when we were looking at the census, it actually gives hints of um, and, and tips on when you're look when you're searching because sometimes it's just small things that you wouldn't think of. Um, like for instance, when I was saying like put less information or you know put it in this way. Um, that you just don't really think about, but actually can make a big difference just because of how their software and everything works. Um, but sometimes it's pretty interesting to, to look through like exactly, like this is telling you what types of records and what, what information is going to be on those, which is pretty awesome. Uh, let's see, so it's like talking about bonds, guardianships, um, inventories. So this is Wills. Okay. I'm going to do my last name. 
I'm going to do randomly. Okay, what would it be there? 18. Hmm. I'm going to do 46. Yeah, it's Vermont. Franklin, definitely. Okay, let's see what we get. Aha, wait a second. No, that's not who I'm thinking. Okay, so this is very broad. Um, and the dates are kind of all over the place. Let me see if I can find... Ooh, I do like that it actually gives you, it, it's again very much like Ancestry, you can just hover over and it'll give you a little preview of what information is actually going to be on there. Um, I think I may need to do, yeah, this is more 1900s, I don't think they've really got as far back as I was looking. Oh, nope, there's a couple 1800s on there. Okay. I do recognize a couple of names on here. I was just looking for someone in particular. And again, sometimes it's just, you might want to just browse through then, you know, oh, I don't see it if, uh, you know, right off the bat. So, yes, I can filter. Um, that would be smart. Let's see. Ah, went too far. Okay, edit. Okay, let me just look for them specifically. How about that? I'm going to do. Yeah, no, that'll work. Oh, yeah, no, I, I should, uh, let me try this real quick. Wait, that was New York. I don't actually think it'll allow you to change the results by, like, make it alphabetical or anything like that. Um, I wish it did. That would make things a lot easier as well. Although I think it's doing it automatically. Uh, no, it's not. I thought it was. Darn it. Oh. Sorry, I'm going all over the place here. <laughs> okay, let me try one more time. Okay. 20, and it was Vermont. Oh, it's New York. Come on. Here we go. Okay. It's probably close enough. I'm going to go ahead and click on that. All right. So. Yes, and so you can notice here, um, it'll actually mention, um, I kind of mentioned this earlier, uh, it's actually telling you not all the information on the record image has been transcribed. That means what's showing up here in the index is only a bare minimum of what's actually going to be in the record, which is why I always say if you're on, not even just this site, but uh, like for instance, if you're using familysearch.com, or sorry, .org, um, they kind of work the same way where they may have um, the image as well, but I always recommend like, yes, the index, but then look to double check on the um, document itself. A lot of times there's going to be more information, especially like, for instance, you're looking in um, census records that are, you know, closer to the, to the turn of the century and then, you know, into the 20th century. There's a lot more information that's going to be on that census that isn't necessarily going to show up in the index. So, um, They've actually started putting a lot more on there, but sometimes like occupation may not be or things like that. And this, of course, I mean, this is a, um, this is a will, I think. Is it? I believe so. And of course, they're not going to put literally everything that's on here in the, in the index. There's just going to be too much information. Okay, let me go back to the. All right, 
I'm trying to find one where they don't have an index for it yet. You have to go through it. Um, we might have to, to use that as an example back in when we do fold three, because they, they tend to do that. Um, search maps and photos. Kind of cool. And that's pretty cool. That's pretty much, yeah, it's the same they're doing the search engines. All right, so that's pretty much what I have so far as a basic look at Ancestry and Heritage Quest. Um, you guys have any more questions, please let me know. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I can go over for you guys that I'm not thinking of. Um, oh, um, they also, looks like Heritage Quest also has their own search age as well. This is pretty much the same yeah, at such the same as Ancestry Snail. Um, looks like they got maps too, though. Um, oh, that's actually pretty interesting. They do have a cool interactive map if you're not sure, like for instance, when the state was, um, when it was made a state, things like that. Um, real quick though, if, oh, is that interactive county line? I haven't actually seen this before. I apologize. That is actually pretty cool. Um, so it looks like this is an interactive um, map for different states and things like that. Um, might be for counties. Uh, there's actually another resource you can use. I use it a lot. Um, it's the, um, it's Newberry. Let's see if I can find that, show you guys real quick. Let's see, historic. Uh, boundaries. Yes, this is Newberry Library in Illinois, I believe. Um, it is a interact historic atlas of historic county boundaries. This I actually really like. It's very user friendly. Um, I recommend this to people, especially like I was saying earlier, you may not know when an area has, um, uh, if it was part of the county or that it currently is now. Uh, so in, for instance, if I click on Virginia here, it literally starts in 18 or 1634 and you can just go by year. Um, so when the boundaries change and it'll literally tell you. So for instance, and it's a, a, a real map, a modern map. So for instance, it will give you the current locations. So it gives you an idea of where. So let me see if I can find Front Royal, for instance. Mm, might be too far over. Yeah, this has definitely come in handy for me. There's, I think, too far. There's Harrisonburg. <laughs> That's because I was over West Virginia. <laughs> okay, there's, there's Front Royal. Okay, so you can see, like, this was back in 1824. We were technically, town of Front Royal was Frederick, but some of the county was Shenandoah. So this is a really a good resource if you're looking at other states and you're not quite sure. You know, they said, oh, they lived over here, but if you're looking for a record, you know, 200 years before that, it may not have been called um, that at the time. So I would share that really quickly. So, all right, everybody, that's all I have. Um, again, feel free to type in any questions. I'll probably, let's see, is this on the library's list of online resources? Um, you know what, I'm not sure if it's been updated. Let me do a quick check here. If not, I am definitely gonna have that added. Um, Google history. Um, actually, this is something I can go over for you really quickly. Um, again, this is our genealogy page. It lists our online databases. It also lists um, what we have in our local history room, um, the obituaries that we have, and then these are the links to other resources. I do need to clean this. There's a couple ones that I found that um, have either been updated or the uh, link does not work anymore. Um, I think Cindy's list is another one that Ancestry's taken over. Um, there's one for Family Search, Ellis Island. I'm not seeing. Yeah, I'm not seeing it on here. I'm going to have that that changed though. I'll definitely go ahead and add that. Um, 
although I will go ahead and have a copy that URL for you guys and put it in the chat for you. It'll let me. Oh, it won't let me, darn it. Okay, well, I will definitely try and add that to the website for you guys. I'm sorry, I couldn't put that in the chat. Uh, we do have oh, one other thing I want to add really quickly. They have the Ellis Island. You can create an account, a free account with them as well. Um, and they have some stuff you can search through. This is one I like to talk about, um, Internet Archive. Um, it's archive.org, I believe. If you're looking for an old family um, genealogy book that you can't, it hasn't been digitized, so it's not going to be on Ancestry or any of the other sites. Um, sometimes it has been digitized and it's on archive, um, uh, the Internet Archive. Uh, you can find that sometimes we've had a couple of books that um, we had patrons trying to find, they try to do it through what we have interlibrary loan, um, which would have, you know, charged them $5 for shipping, but we were able to find it for them on archive where they could just search through it. And that is our resources. All right, well, it was a pleasure doing this presentation for you guys. Again, we're gonna try and do another one. Um, and it's going to be uh, next month, and then uh, we also have one in, let's see, I think it's July, so I'm going to do another Ancestry. Um, so it should be on our calendar, and it would just, you would uh, sign up for them the same way you would register, and then we'll send you a Zoom meeting as well, or a, a link to the Zoom uh, meeting. And um, again, this is part of our adult summer reading program, so if you guys are interested, if you go to our website, uh, feel free to sign up. We have a lot of cool prizes, um, and we're, we also have a bunch of other programs as well. Uh, we're doing a lot of things through Zoom since we can't um, be here physically at the library, but we still have a lot of cool things you can do. So 